On today's episode of Creation.com Talk, we are discussing tiny ancient humans found in the fossil record. These are very small stature, ape men or people. That's an open discussion. So Homo naledi found in South Africa, Homo luzonensis found in the Philippines, and Homo floresiensis found in Indonesia. I am Dr. Robert Carter. I'm here with my dear friend, Joel Tay. Joel, tell me, are these people, how do we explain them in a creation context, or is this good ev- evidence for evolutionary theory? Yeah, just as a give, to give you the conclusion at the very start, um, they are humans, and um, they are post-flood descendants of Noah. But let us just deal with the first candidate that we have here. And the first one is Homo naledi. naledi. Yes, do you want to talk about that? Okay. Well, where was this found? Well, this is found actually in Africa, in a cave. It's called the Rising Star okay. Cave System in South Africa. And this cave is strange because it's really deep into the ground and you have to take a long time just to go in there. But when you get into that cave, you have to crawl in there and they find 1,550 bone fragments. And that's a lot. I mean, if you know anything about um, uh, homo, um, human bones or ancient man bones, they are hard to find. They, are, they come in you know, yeah. a few pieces at a time. Have, for you to find... Of- fragments and little pieces of various skeletons without having a full skeleton. Yeah. This is a giant jumble of a lot of different individuals. 1,500. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. And, and they yeah. actually said that... So how many, indiv- how many individuals is this? How many people are buried in here? We are not sure, but those who found it say that there are at least 15 individuals ranging from really young to an old man as well. So, um, and way deep in a cave. Now, I am a caver. I've done a lot of caving over the years. I've led caving expeditions. I've spent a lot of time underground. And I can tell you that caving is no small endeavor. And looking at the, uh, the diagram of this cave and listening to the reports of the people who have been in there, it's a tight squeeze and it is way back from the surface. How on earth, I'm thinking, would an ape been able to go way back in a cave? Well, they would never do it. But even an ancient human, I mean, I use flashlights and helmets and knee pads. What, how on earth did these people get so far back with, and what kind of a, a light source were they using? Yes, and what's interesting, if you read some of the reports, um, the researchers, right, when they wanted to find these bones, they had to employ paleontologists who were small size, like, like women who are shorter in stature, in order to fit into some of these holes. It takes them 45 yeah, minutes to go in there. some of that, though, was, was just propaganda. <laughs> they had the media campaign. They wanted the cute graduate students for the photo op. I mean, there aren't any skinny guys who could have done it, but okay, puts out a stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, but if you're taking 45 minutes to go in there. people would not have made it but that far back in the cave. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but 45 minutes to go in there, 45 minutes to come out, you know, you need a light source, you know, what kind of torch do you need? What kind of fire do you need to, to be able to light your way in there? Uh, and that's also the danger of carbon dioxide build up and things like that. Yeah. So this well, is alone... Is it possible that this isn't a burial that these individuals were washed into the cave? Some people want to say that. Well, some people have been considering that, I mean, because we have so many bones and the bones are disarticulated, that means they are kind of scattered about. But if okay. this was something that was washed in, you would expect most of the bones to be in a pile. But these are you know, evenly distributed. And some of the cave systems in there, you really have to climb up before you climb down again. Yeah. And um, that works against this idea that it was just washed in. It seems to be that this is some kind of a burial site. And just looking at this, the, the need for technology and light to go in, that they are, if this is a burial site, it tells you that these are most likely human beings, right? Because only human beings bury the dead. They have a belief in the afterlife and um, they use fire and technology and things like that. So, so Rob, All do you right. want to discuss um, what makes these individuals so unique? Yeah, um, what fi- makes them unique and what makes them human? Mm-hmm. And why would we say these are human and not ape men or apes? And well, the answer is that, that they're, even though they're small, I mean, you know, a little more than three feet, a little more than one meter tall, that this is, these are tiny mm-hmm. people. When you look at the, uh, the inside of the, the skull, you can make a mold of the inside of the skull and you can look at different parts of the brain because the brain affects the shape of the inside of the skull. And they've got the parts of the brain that modern humans have and apes do not have. Mm-hmm. Yes, so right. the, Huge distinction right there is they look like people, but their brains are, you know, 466, 560 cubic centimeters. Yeah. Modern humans is what? 12 to 1500 on average, somewhere in that range? Yeah, that's right. So at least two to three times of that, more than two, two times of that. But if you have difficulty trying to picture that in your mind, that's, 
that's 500. And um, so they have anywhere between 466 to 560 cubic centimeters. And um, that's about the brain size. Um, but like you say, they have a human brain, right? They have what they call a BA10. Yeah. And BA10 is the part of the brain that's only found in humans, not in apes. It's used right. for strategic thinking, for abstract thought, um, planning, multitasking. Like burying your dead deep in a cave. Yeah, things like that. Yeah, things like that. And the second part of the brain that is distinctively human is what they call the uh, Broca speech area. And as that title yes. tells you, that's for language. And, you know, in, in a previous episode, I discussed some of the so-called ape men with Dr. Johnson Safati, and we covered Homo erectus, we covered Neanderthals, and we showed that these are fully humans. In this case, um, Homo naledi is actually very similar to Homo erectus in many aspects, except that it's okay, even wait, smaller hold, hold, Homo erectus. Yes. We have modern man. Modern yes. man with our, our high foreheads and our erect stature and our relatively thin bones. How mm -hmm. does that compare to Homo erectus? Well, um, from the neck down, they're very much like us. I mean, there's slight right. difference in the in the pelvis, for example. It's a little bit more flaring. Um, some of their rib structures a bit more. Um, how should I say? It? Uh, flares out this way. Yeah, bell shaped. Yeah, bell shaped. The modern the modern shape is pretty much barrel shaped. Okay. Yeah, and and the skull. Um, it is clearly human because again they have all these parts of the brain that tells you they're human, but yes, they have but the a brain low, is smaller, much smaller brain and a sloping forehead. That's one of the key distinctive. And yeah. Yep. And so with Homo naledi, um, they have a lot of the same things, except that they are much smaller in size. And in fact, you know, Homo naledi is not that they're small, not that small. In fact, if they were to stand beside me, they are just under five feet. They'll be about here. I'm not oh, very so tall not myself. as small as I said a minute ago. Um, that some of the, the rest you'll be talking about, they're very small, but they're still small. I mean, okay. Okay. no, I, I'm a small size guy. I should have known that. Yeah, they're, they're about, about this height. Um, okay. So their brain is even smaller than Homo erectus, and that is why this became controversial ah. in the first place. Yes. Yeah. But, but like, brain like size say, does not equal intelligence, and that's something that a lot of people have a hard time getting their, brain, their head around. Uh, we have, in modern humans, you can have people who have twice as large a brain as other people, and yet they're perfectly intelligent, normal people. And if you can double brain size without affecting intelligence, that means that brain size doesn't equal intelligence. It's brain organization that really sets humans apart. And these things have a human organized brain. If you like this sort of information, don't forget to subscribe by clicking on the button and then click on the bell icon so that when a new episode of creation.com talk comes out, you'll be notified. We are constantly producing new information for people like you. We are here to help and we want you to plug into the great information that CMI is producing. Okay, but apes have different hands than humans. Apes have different feet than humans. Apes have different pelvic structures than humans, which means that apes really can't stand up. They can, but it takes a lot of muscle to stand up. It's uncomfortable for them. Humans are naturally upright. Does Naledi have human hands, human feet, and human hips? Yes, they do. In fact, they are very similar to humans, like I say, Homo erectus in many ways. Um, okay. The thing... Uh, Okay, so Homo erectus, we have already said that they are humans. So Naledi has a smaller brain, but one thing about the shape of the skull is that it's actually slightly more to modern humans like us than to Homo erectus. Just the overall so shape like, as well. It's just like a smaller version of the modern human brain. Yeah, if you think of erectus, cool. like I mentioned, they have a sloping forehead. So Naledi has yeah. a slightly higher forehead and a rounder skull. So um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and slightly flatter face compared to erectus as well. So if erectus okay. is human, this is completely human. Like you say, the hands, the feet, um, the, the overall skull, the, the backbone, they're, they're all human in every way. And maybe the bones on the hands are slightly more curved, but they're still human. I mean, if you look at the ape hand and the, the ape feet and hands, it's, it's, it's very different from that of a human. Okay. Um, but also, modern humans can have curved finger bones too, depending upon... Uh, what kind of work they're doing. Yes. If you're gripping things like athletes or blacksmiths or, you know, people who grip things constantly, uh, they, they can actually curve their finger bones. Yes, that's Because right. bones are dynamic. They don't, they're not always the same shape your entire life. They change depending upon the stresses that we put upon them. So, so that's not abnormal here. Okay. So, so, so the question people are having, though. Yeah, why are they so how small? Did they get, right? Yeah, why are they so small? How did they get so small? <laughs> These are human beings... And they're post-flood and they come from Noah's family. Why are they so tiny? Wait, first, how do we know they're post-flood? That's the question we get a lot. Yeah. Well, actually, I wrote an article on creation.com. Uh, are Neanderthals pre-flood? 
And I said, no, Neanderthals are absolutely post-flood. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is their DNA is inside modern people. Two is uh, the fossil record is produced by the flood and Neanderthals are buried in caves and things like that, which have to be post-flood burials. So that also applies to Homo naledi. Mm -hmm. They have to be post-flood. The, the bones are not going to survive a worldwide catastrophic flood that's depositing a mile of sediment on most continental surfaces. Many people ask CMI about a Genesis commentary that would defend the truth of creation. There have been some good ones a few years ago, but creation science has come a long way since then. There's so many new discoveries about radioactive dating, cell machinery, the Ice Age, catastrophic plate tectonics, distant starlight, and even the Christian foundations of science. That is why we now have the Genesis account. Now being used by many Bible colleges, we wanted it to be especially helpful for pastors and expository preaching. This is one commentary that many have read cover to cover, followed by using it as a reference to see what a passage means. It shows how all the doctrines of Christianity have their foundations in the early chapters of Genesis. And it also explains how Jesus and the New Testament writers understood Genesis. And how do the church fathers, medieval theologians and reformers understand Genesis before the rise of long age science? The Genesis account is available in hardcover and ebook formats right now at creation.com slash store. It's a good point. So but why 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 are they so small if they why, are what? but why would yeah, Homo why the lady so, be so small? What do you think? Well, um one of the biggest um one of the best reasons I would I would think I mean, there could be multiple reasons, but I would what they call insular dwarfism and the or the island yes. effect. And that is the idea that when um, small groups of people, they isolate themselves on an island or even creatures and they interbreed among themselves, um, especially for lack of resources, size. they change size. They tend to take on a much smaller size as well. And we often see dwarf versions of, oh, examples, elephants mm -hmm. on Indonesian islands, miniature elephants. Yes. We see small sizes of a lot of things, but we also have the opposite. There's sometimes gigantism can happen on islands like the Komodo dragon mm -hmm. or the dodo bird, which was just a pigeon that got <laughs> so big it couldn't fly anymore. Or the elephant bird. You know, we have examples of gigantic things in restricted areas, but also tiny things. But this isn't an island. This Africa is a continent. How could we apply insular dwarfism to people living on a continent? Well, we know that some people groups tend to interbreed among themselves a lot. So the yes. Neanderthals, uh, we see from their features that they, are, they have a lot of developmental defects. So they have uh, facial features that the skull is kind of asymmetrical. They are, yeah, um, asymmetry in your, in your skull is a classic sign of some developmental defect. We see that a lot in a lot of the ancient bones. Yeah, okay. and we see that in some of these smaller humans as well. So this yeah. gives us a clue that they are actually uh, inbred. And Neanderthals, you're the geneticist here. You want to talk about Neanderthals' DNA and how we know that they're inbred? Um, no. That will be a long lecture. But <laughs> when we look at Neanderthals, what we see is what's called runs of homozygosity. That is, you look at a Neanderthal skeleton and this huge section of DNA, the person inherited the same exact letters from both their mother and their father. Like you and I are probably heterozygous at maybe 3 million different letters in our genome. Mm -hmm. Neanderthals are a lot less than that. They're the most inbred population we've ever seen. The DNA we pulled out of Denisovans and some other ancient home uh, humans, we also see a lot of inbreeding. So the, the basic model is after Noah's flood, people start spreading out across the world after the Tower of Babel. And some people got really far away from the main human population and became very inbred. And for multiple generations, they only intermarried with themselves. And Homo naledi is probably an example of that. Mm. Okay. So like you said, they are inbred. And that's why they have that asymmetrical features or skull yeah. shapes. And we see the same thing in Homo naledi. So it's a logical, it's a fair assumption that they have also been inbreeding. And that's why they have this uh, insular dwarfism effect among them. So one thing, okay. Rob. Um, yeah. How old do evolutionists claim these bones are? Oh boy, uh, the dating is all over the place. Uh, currently, or the, the, the initial estimates were two to three million years old, which is you know much much older than biblical time. But that's fine. The evolutionists like to put 
long dates on things. But that was too old. Two to three million years is way before modern humans are supposed to have arisen. In fact, even any humans are supposed to have arisen, but they look too human. So I said, they can't be that old. Mm -hmm. So they started wrestling with the dates and they used multiple different dating methods. I mean, I think six different dating methods and they got ranges all over the place, but it's pretty much settled down now to, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred thousand years old. What do you think? You know, like, like you said, they took two years to test the bones and they finally found two methods two different methods that kind of overlap the dates. And so they yeah. took the date and that date is 236,000 to 335,000. And that's okay. exactly where they want it to be, right? If they want, because according to evolution, uh, modern humans came about 300,000 years ago. So by putting at that time, they can kind of consider humans as some kind of a transition in, from, from the earlier erectors and all that into the modern, modern human type. Okay, um, that's really interesting though. That means that they cherry pick their dates from different dating methods and they reject some dating methods because it didn't give them dates that they wanted. Yes, that's right. Very interesting. Okay, what about carbon dating? Can you carbon date these bones? Yes, we can. And that's kind of interesting because when CMI heard about this, we actually issued them a public challenge. We said that we will pay for the carbon dating if they test it, but they, they declined. But later on, we found out that they decided to carbon date the bones themselves and the bones gave us a date of 33,000 to 35,000 years. Of course, so carbon dates... tenth the amount of time that the other dating methods yielded. That's right. Of course, carbon wow. dates are not accurate, but these dates is way too young for them. So what yeah. did they do, Rob? Well, they, they ignored the carbon dating and went with the dates that they wanted. Yes, and so why to, do you think that is? Uh, because... A lot of the information coming out of paleoanthropology is uncomfortable to the evolutionists and challenges the evolutionary model. They don't want these things to be human. They don't want them to be young. They can't be human because of evolution. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're far back and, and more related to apes than we are because of evolution. And sadly, we're not going to get any DNA out of these bones. Well, first of all, old bones is really hard to get DNA out of. But when they were excavating these, and I, I literally slapped my forehead when I saw the pictures, they weren't using clean room technology. They weren't wearing masks. They weren't wearing gloves. They weren't dropping bone fragments and DNA preserving solutions. As soon as a human hand touches an ancient bone, it's ruined because the DNA says in the oils of our skin penetrate the bone and destroy the DNA. <laughs> now, hopefully in the future, maybe they'll get the petrous bone out of a skull or something like that, because that has been shown to have a lot more DNA than most of the other bones. Maybe they'll work on DNA, but they weren't thinking about it because they assumed these things were so old. So just All right, let's move on to hu uh, tiny human number two. Okay. But, Homo but floresiensis. Yeah. The Hobbit. Oh man, the Hobbit. Okay. Uh, I would just what call it the Hobbit what, what because the I have Hobbit? trouble pronouncing that name. <laughs> So, <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so the Hobbit, so what they found, this is actually in Indonesia, so it's on the other side of the world. And in the cave, yep. they found another one of these so-called small human beings. They found leg bones, they found hands, feet, uh, the pelvis, and later on, they begin to find uh, bones from other individuals. At first, two, and later on, 14 individuals. Um, in this case, the, the, the skull is even actually smaller than Homo lady. So you're yeah. talking about 420 uh, cubic centimeters. So when and the stature was smaller than Homo naledi also. Much smaller. Much this, smaller yeah. right? So this is um, below four foot, so three foot plus. And okay. when so what I said earlier about naledi, I was thinking about the hobbit. I yes. I'm confused. Yeah, okay. that's right. So the hobbit. So this is even smaller, three, three, three feet, six inches tall. At first, they thought it was a, a child. But when they look at it, they saw that it because had, it was so small. Yeah, because it had developed um, wisdom teeth, it had um, developed brow ridges, and they concluded that this had to be a female adult. So these are small individuals. Okay. Again, isolated on an island. Yes. Far, far, far from the main center of diversity of humans, which is in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. All right. And you get small humans again. And what's interesting yeah. about this is, um, like we mentioned with Homo the Lady, when you look at the brain, um, the endocast of the brain, the structure of the brain, it again has yep. this BA10, which is clearly human. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Um, so, so these are tiny people is what they are. So Joel, how old do the evolutionists think these bones are? Well, in this case, they actually carbon date that and they got 18,000 okay. years and that's the date that they use. 
Not the bones. Uh, they didn't what? test the bones. They test the surrounding limestone around the bone. Ah, yes. Yep. Because okay. limestone is made of calcium carbonate. Therefore, it has carbon in it. Therefore, some of the carbon is carbon-14. But dating cave uh, sediments and cave rocks is extremely difficult because they accumulate over time and you have all sorts of influences from the outside uh, changing things. I mean, yeah, dating in caves is very difficult. Yes. So I'm surprised they actually accepted any uh, standard carbon date for that, but I guess they did. All right. Well, but other evolutionists actually tried to come up with other dates for, for this individual. So uh, the dates that they have yeah. now range anywhere from like what we say to up to 700,000 years, which is way older, way older than even Homo lady. So again, you see the evolutionary yeah. dates, they are all over the place, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, are these human humans i mean are they smart are they you know caveman with rocks do they have any tools or anything like that it is interesting so they, they actually make uh, stone tools micro blades awls um spearheads so we know that they're, they're actually using tools they're butchering their food we know they cook okay. their food um they yep. actually hunted dwarf elephants so early on you mentioned dwarf elephants so uh, dwarf elephants are actually found on this island and we we, we find evidence that these bones are actually butchered um, so, and one more thing about to get to this island, like you mentioned, they actually have to travel like 19 kilometers. And this is during the ice age where the water level is much lower. To get to this but island, still, still they, they had to sail. Yes, they had to sail 19 kilometers in a, um, in a huge group oh. together against yeah, ocean currents. Ocean, against so they the need boat, they need planning, they have to build things, they have to sail. They need and navigation. These are yeah. human beings, That's not right. monkeys. That's but right. something else really interesting about Flores Island is that there is a group of people that are pygmies living on Flores Island, and they're much smaller than other people's living on the island. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the reason that they've maintained this, this size difference is the people groups don't necessarily mix very much. They stay apart from one another, therefore inbreeding within one people group over a long time has preserved a small stature. Wow, I'm just wondering if maybe... Homo floresiensis is the ancestors of the pygmies that live there today. We could, could don't be. know. We don't know. <laughs> but we can't know because the bones have disintegrated. Yes, that's right. God, it kills me that they, they weren't able to preserve <laughs> the bones. I don't think they ever would have gotten DNA out of them anyway based on the, the state. But all we know is that they found something and there's not much left for remains. All right, let's move on to our third and final tiny human. This is Homo luzonensis found on Luzon Island in the Philippines. Joel, tell us about Homo luzonensis. Again, another small-sized human being, this time around about four feet tall. And they only found a few bones in a cave. Again, it's a cave, so that's post-flood. Um, yeah. And again, to get to this island, they need um, sailing scale. They need to be able to make boats and things like that to get to these places. They found two, hum two ad bones from two adults and a child, but just fragments. So what they found was a foot bone, seven teeth from an upper jaw, um, two finger bones, okay. two toe bone, and one thigh bone. And the teeth, we can tell straight away that they're very human-like, except that the molars are slightly smaller than what most of us would have. Again, finger bones. A lot of ancient men like Denisovans and Neanderthals, they have larger molars than yes. modern humans. So yeah. these guys had smaller molars than modern humans. Okay, so we're talking about a range of variability in tooth size amongst people. Yes, that's right. Okay. And their fingers are slightly curved, but again, like Homo naledi. Just like naledi. Yep. Uh, the okay. toes are slightly curved, the same thing. And the, the bones are actually... How tall were they? Four feet. Four feet tall. Okay. And they're actually very similar to the Hobbit in, in many ways as well. So, I mean, they're Philippines, Indonesia. There could be some kind of uh, ancestry link. We do not know. Evolutionists have dated this to 67,000 years ago. But, you know, okay. in all these dates that we have had so far, we talk about 67,000 with the Hobbit, 33,000. And then um, with, um, with Homo the Lady, of course, they have an older date. But when you carbon date, that gives them a, a lower age. All these dates are far too young for them to be transitional forms. And they are all humans. Again, with yep. these bones in the Philippines, we know that um, uh, in the cave, we find remains of deers and pigs. So... Parallel cuts and on the bones. Butchered. They're butchered. They're butchered. Yes. They have cut uh, marks on the bone from knives. So clearly, these people were eating these animals. Yeah. And then they found right. stone tools nearby, um, which, yeah. you know, evolutionists debate whether these are made for the same group of people or not. 
but these stone tools are associated with a butchered rhinoceros. So they have to be able to hunt rhinoceros. The thing is that when they test these dates using the evolutionary dating method, almost 770,000 um, years old. So that's, again, you see, the dating methods all over the place for them. All over the place. Yes. So we could conclude that multiple groups of very small humans lived on the earth after the flood. Their descendants of Noah, they were intelligent, they had spiritual aspects to them. We, we know these are people. This is not a giant challenge to the biblical story. It's not like there's other people alive on earth when Adam and Eve were created. These are descendants of Adam and Eve. Hey, Joel, tell the audience where they can find more information. Well, if you like that, we, I would highly encourage you to check out this book. This is called Contested Bones by Chris Wu. Excellent book. We sell that on our website, and this would be, I think, the most up-to-date resource on, on this whole human and ape um, debate. And if you like okay. more of a video and documentary, this is one that came out recently. It's called Dismantled that covers yes, some of great. the same issues as well. Chris made that. I'm actually in that. I was one of the people that got interviewed for that. Yes, that's so right. So I can give it a big thumbs up. Excellent movie. Okay. Excellent movie and excellent book. Highly recommend this too. We also have a lot of articles on creation.com going back decades talking about Neanderthals and ape men and evolutionary claims and creationist answers. You're not alone here. We have a lot of material for you. So just dig in. It's there for you. 